Well, good afternoon and welcome to our afternoon service here in Cardiff. And before we um, begin our service, just wanting to remind our folks that Bible study and prayer meeting is on this Wednesday, half past seven, and we will meet in Cardiff Hall, uh, but also through online means. And Lord willing, the next bulletin for next month will be available uh, by lo next Lord's Day. And please bear in mind uh, the communion season in uh, April with the Lord's Day, the communion Lord's Day uh, for the 14th of April, and Lord willing, we'll be meeting here. And so um, all the details will be printed on the bulletin uh, in due time. And all the other uh, important information is printed there also, all subject to the will of God. So let us worship God. Let us sing to God's praise by singing from the Scottish Psalter, Psalm 100, Psalm 100, the first version. Psalm 100. And we have this wonderful picture of praise of the people uh, before the Lord. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with mirth, his praise forth tell. Come ye before him and rejoice. And so here, this is a, an invitation, a command from, uh, to all people uh, to praise God, to come with joy, with come, to come with delight, and to bow before him. Why? We're given two reasons in verse 3. Know that the Lord is God indeed. Without our aid, he did us make. We are his flock, he doth us feed. And for his sheep he doth us take. So the first reason is that he is our creator. He has pro propriety over us. He has a claim on us, on each one of us, even boys and girls, you are too. And uh, he is the one who has created us, who made us. But so there's a second reason, more intimate reason. We are his flock, he doth us feed. And for his sheep he doth us take. And so, yes, he is also that shepherding king, the one who is full of mercy, who is full of kindness, who takes us, who feeds us. And that points us to the one who is the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And dear people of God, flock of Christ, what a wonderful encouragement and a burning reason for us to gather together, even this afternoon on this Lord's Day, to rejoice in him and to lay hold of him. For why? The Lord our God is good. His mercy is forever sure. His truth at all times firmly stood and shall from age to age endure. So let us sing to God's praise, Psalm 100, the first version.
Well, let us say uh, unite together in prayer. Let us call upon the name of the Lord. Let us rise if able. O sovereign and almighty God, as we bow before the throne of grace and of glory, this afternoon we do rejoice. We do uh, echo the psalmist, the uh, church of all ages, and to cry out for why the Lord our God is good. His mercy is forever sure. His truth at all times firmly stood and shall from age to age endure. O oh, gracious God, we are once again reminded of the one who sits uh, upon the praises of the heavenly hosts and saints in heaven, uh, the one who is worthy of our praise, and the one who has invited us uh, to come with joy and delight to because, O oh Lord our God, uh, we uh, come confessing the creatorship of God. Without our aid, he did us make. And we do stand amazed, O oh sovereign God, that we have been commanded and invited even this afternoon to gather in this meeting house to take part in worship and praise. Almighty God, we are being reminded that we can only do so by that divine grace through and in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious shepherd of his wandering sheep. And we confess, O oh Lord, that by ourselves we are nothing but sinners so very unworthy. And every deed, every word, every thought of our own by our sinful nature would only contaminate the holy things of God. Yet we come with joy and great delight as we are reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who takes us unworthy sinners as his sheep. And he is the one who cares for us and feeds us even this afternoon. And it is in him, as we were reminded this morning, that we are loved with that eternal love of the Father. And so, once again, Heavenly Father, that love is shown to, that is shown to us is truly amazing. And we confess that we can never uh, truly fathom uh, the depth of that great love. And it is certainly not down to us, but down to the Lord Jesus Christ, the only great high priest, the only mediator of the everlasting covenant, and the one who is holy, harmless, and undefiled. And it is he who stood in our place. It is he who alone can defend his guilty people by his glorious merits of his spotless life, his active obedience and his passive obedience on that cross of Calvary, even unto death. And it is only through him and him only that we can come before our great God to offer our worship and praise. And so, Heavenly Father, Please remind us of what a blessing it is, what a wonderful means of grace given unto us that we can gather at this time for public worship, to hear the word, to sing from the word. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that we may know of that divine help in all the aspects during this time of worship, that we as a people will be drawn closer and closer to behold the beauty and the greatness of Christ. And Lord, we pray also for those who are still outside of grace this afternoon, those who are still in love with the things and the sins of this world, we pray, O oh Lord, that by the Word and the Holy Spirit, a sovereign operation, that they may, uh, they may be led to have that saving glimpse of the, the beauty of Christ and to see how glorious, how suitable, how, how gracious and compassionate he is <clears throat> to poor and needy sinners like us. And Lord, help us as we seek to worship uh, in spirit and in truth. Grant that we may not be distracted by the things in this world, in our hearts, in our minds. Help us by the Holy Spirit's grace that we may gaze upon Christ. <clears throat> And you find that comfort in him and him only. And so, gracious God, we pray that as we open the, the word of God, uh, we may uh, see the eternal word of God. 
the Lord Jesus. And Lord, we also pray for those who are not able to gather with us physically here this afternoon to worship with us. We pray for them. We pray for many blessings upon them and that uh, divine presence uh, with them as they make use of the electronic means. And Lord, uh, we pray that our hearts and our beings would be governed by the word of God and to the glory of God. Help us and strengthen us as a people and as a congregation. And bless uh, each one as we gather here. And bless those uh, who gather in different places across the world as part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And grant us all the eyes of faith to behold our beloved Savior, the only Lord and Redeemer. And so, Lord, help us in these things and pardon of our sins. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the scripture reading for this afternoon is from Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll read from verse 1 all the way to uh, 20. Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 1 all the way to 20. So hear the word of the Lord. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. By fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not uh, even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather a giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And therefore, do not be particular with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. And therefore he says, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk uh, circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless his holy and inerrant word. At this point of the service, the offering for the Lord's work is to be received. Well, let us continue worship by singing from Psalm 40. 
from the Scottish Song, the Psalm 40, and we shall sing to God's praise from verses 5 to 9. Verses 5 to 9. And here we have the psalmist David praising not his own works, but the glorious works that the Lord has done and the gracious care that he has for him. Lo, o Lord, my God, full many are the wonders thou hast done. Thy gracious thoughts to outwards far above all thoughts are gone. In order, none can reckon them to thee if them declared, and speak of them I would, they more can be numbered are. And so here, as he tries to even recall some of the gracious thoughts that the Lord has, the gracious deeds that the Lord has done, he is not able to number them all because they are so fast. And in, not only do we have this declaration of the graciousness of God, here we are being introduced to someone who is other than the psalmist David. No sacrifice, verse 6, no offering, didst thou at all desire, mine ears thou bore, sin offering thou, and burns didst not require. And here there is no um, the mention of no sacrifice, no offering, but then we hear, mine ears thou bore, it's a picture of the ear being uh, pierced. There's a hole, and it talks about the slave in the Old Testament who loves to be a willing slave to the master. And there's that, uh, oh, to be made and, uh, and to be a mark of that willing service. And here we are given this willing servant, far greater, far more willing than David himself. And he himself would become that very sacrifice. Then to the Lord these words, uh, these were my words. I come, behold, and see within the volume of the book, it written is of me. So it is speaking of the very willing servant, the servant of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself would become, and he has become, that perfect sacrifice. And, uh, and that delight even, verse 8, to do thy will, I take delight. O thou, my God, that art. Yea, that most holy law of thine I have within my heart. And so uh, we see that there. And so let us sing to God's praise. Verses 5 to 9 of Psalm 40.
Well, dear congregation, there are so many different ways for us to know the identity of other people. And one of which is by observing what they are doing. And what do I mean by that? Well, boys and girls, say, for example, in an event of an emergency, you need to get help in a public place. Well, what do you do? You would look for someone who is wearing their uniform, either the security guard or the police officer on duty. Or perhaps we can go past an area noticing that it is, say, a construction site by their high-vis clothing and the tools that they are using. And the same can go with, say, a concert with music being played or a sports stadium, a hearing songs or slogans even being shouted out. The list can go on and on. In other words, we are not simply able to tell what they are doing, but we're able to tell who they are as well. Well, what about spiritually? What about the identity of being a Christian, a spirit-filled believer? Are there things that we're called to do in the Christian life because of that union that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ by faith alone? Yes. Well, the answer to that is yes. Even in how we make use of the songbook that the Lord has given unto us. And so let us return to our series of studies in the letter to the Ephesians. As many of us know that we have begun a mini-series on verse 19 of this chapter under the overall theme, the songs of the Spirit. Well, this afternoon we hope to come to the third and last sermon on this verse. And the title for the sermon is this, The Use of the Songs of the Spirit. The Use of the Songs of the Spirit. And we hope to consider the remaining aspects under the two thoughts. Firstly, the speaking in fellowship. And secondly, the singing in worship. The use of the songs of the Spirit. The speaking in fellowship. And secondly, the singing in worship. Friends, especially for those of us who have been studying through this verse, we may remember in our first sermon, we have looked at the material for praise in the worship of God. As we used the vital principle uh, rediscovered at the time of the Reformation, Scripture interpreting Scripture, we have come to understand that these three items, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, are all referring to the book of Psalms the divine hymn book given by God for his church. And we have also looked at the last part of this verse in our second sermon, namely, making melody in your hearts. And which is that phrase, as we know, which literally means plucking the strings of your heart. In there, we considered whether there is any biblical warrant for the use of musical instruments in the worship of God, especially in the light of the accomplishment of the Lord Jesus Christ in his saving works, thus ending all the shadowy sacrificial rituals of the temple worship. And this afternoon, we are to consider the practical use of the God-given songbook for his church and the life of the Christian. And the congregation, this is not some theory, but the teaching here is extremely practical. It has everything to do with the believer and his or her ongoing Christian life. 
This is exactly what Paul has been writing to the believers in Ephesus, especially as we come to the second half of this epistle, ever since chapter 4. It tells us something so important, and that is the true gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to impact not only our thinking, but our living. The life of the believer is not confined to the talk, but also our walk. In fact, right doctrine should bring about right practice in the Christian life. It is not just declaration, but also exhortation. Indeed, in verse 18, we have this exhortation to not to be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. <clears throat> in other words, the believers in Ephesus, they are, they are to live so very differently. No doubt, some of the believers would know that personally before they came to know the saving grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Their lives would have been, before they came to know Christ, their lives could well have been characterized by this sinful intoxication. Maybe some of them can even recall their own drunken past, dwelling in those hollow, temporary forms of happiness. Not only are they called not to return to the old man, not to fall into that temptation and that addiction, they are also exhorted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is important for us to be reminded that this exhortation, be filled with the Spirit, is in the present tense, which means it is ongoing. In other words, no true believer in Christ can say, well, as long as I have this experience once or twice in my life, at the time of my conversion, well, it must be well with my soul. No, it is rather an ongoing process throughout the entire Christian life. Not only that, as we have considered before, the exhortation here in verse 18 is also a command, a command. It is not optional, nor is it something that we can do it ourselves. It is done for us by the grace of God. And furthermore, this command is not addressed to one single person, for it is in the plural. In other words, this is not done only to the selected few. This command is not for the, for the elite or those who are more prominent within the Ephesian congregation. Neither is it only for office bearers. No, but it is for all members, all of God's people. And therefore, it includes you and it includes me, dear believers. As we know, this command here is not an endorsement, be filled with the Spirit, it's not an endorsement of charismatic movement, somehow seeing ourselves as some massive empty containers that God the Holy Spirit is something that we are to be filled with. No, not at all. Rather, we are to be filled with the Spirit by the means of the Spirit. And dear congregation, maybe some of you are wondering why there is a need to come back to some of these aspects, some of these points back in verse 18. It is so very important as it gives us the key to understanding the truth that is declared in our text this afternoon. Why? The command to be filled with the Spirit is not an invitation to find our own ways or to be uncontrollable, to be unruly in our behavior. 
like in the charismatic movement. That's called emotionalism, and not being filled with the Spirit. As we know from the words of the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth, and He is the one who has inspired the Scriptures. He is the one who has breathed out the Word of God. In that light, do we see the connection between the exhortation here concerning being a spirit-filled believer and the means that God, the Holy Spirit Himself, has ordained? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The way to be filled with the Holy Spirit is by the means that God, the Holy Spirit, has ordained. Do we understand this? How contrary this is to much of Christendom, especially in the here in the West. There seems to be this uh, free for all notion that the notion can be. Put it in, in this way: whatever thing that one comes up with, as long as they are pious sounding, as long as they are baptized with Christian lingo, many would immediately jump to the conclusion that well, that person must be so spirit filled; it must be the work of the Holy Spirit. Sadly, even things that are actually Contrary to the word of God, dear congregation, do we see the great danger in divorcing the work of the Holy Spirit, the means of the Holy Spirit, with the word of God? To be very frank, this is when a lot of cults and heretics begin to form, claiming to have extra revelation, sounding so spiritual. But all the while, very far from the word of God. But God, in His goodness, God in His mercy, He has not left us to ourselves to figure out the means of the Spirit. He is not making us guess. No, not at all. As He has given us His own divine Spirit-inspired songbook for His people to use. As part of what it means to be filled with the Spirit, and do we see how practical it is? As we consider our first point, the speaking in fellowship, the speaking in fellowship. Once again, do we see the command? It, it is a command in the Word of God, and not only that. It is not a command only to ministers and elders. But to all those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, this is part of the practical working, the practical exhortation of what it means to be spirit-filled. My dear beloved in the Lord, do we see the wisdom and the goodness of God? Not only has He given us the songbook for His people in His Word. The Book of Psalms is not only important in the divine worship of God, but it is extremely important also to our fellowship with one another in the household of faith. We are commanded to speak, not only to ourselves, but to one another. Friends, do we see? The great implication from this command and exhortation to us as believers: we are not simply commanded to mention it once or twice, once in a while, but to speak, is speaking continuously, present tense, to speak constantly as opportunities are allowed. Who speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs from God's own songbook, <coughs> friends? 
in order for us to speak a language, what do we, what do we need to do? And boys and girls, I'm sure you understand that. You know that, don't you? Say, when you were little, you could not speak as fluent as now. And what do you have to do? You would have your mom and dad teaching you how to speak, and you would need to be learning the different words to be familiar with the vocabulary. And so much more so, it is with learning a second language. None of us can speak it overnight. We have to study it. We have to memorize the words. We have to know the structure. And we have to learn how to use the words appropriately before we can truly speak the language. And in that light, do we see that this command to speak poses a great challenge to you and to me. Because the command here is not simply to read to one another, but to speak. It tells us that we must have a level of not only of familiarity, a depth of understanding of the songbook that God has given to us. In other words, dear congregation, how familiar are you and am I with the book of Psalms that we can speak with understanding, not only to ourselves, but to one another in the fellowship of God's people? Yes, even in a psalm singing church such as ours. I'm afraid we are not as familiar with God's own inspired songs as we ought. We're not familiar uh, with the songbook given by God as the catchy phrases from the songs of this world. How often do we spend time studying them ourselves, like learning a language? Those of you who learn a, have learned a second language, you know it requires a lot of time and effort. Do we do that with that songbook given by God? Having the songs of the Lord becoming our own songs. I know it is a very useful and a profitable thing for us to memorize scriptures. It's always wonderful. But here we are also given this divine exhortation and command to especially be so familiarized with the Psalms so that we may speak to one another and the fellowship of God's people. Have we thought about this? This would have been <coughs> a great encouragement to the believers in Ephesus and elsewhere in the early church. Why? Because as we know, the early church at that time, they were facing so much hardship with so many trials and difficulties. And not only <coughs> is there the great temptation to forget about the Lord, but there is also the tendency to wallow in despair, to wallow in darkness, thinking that no one else could understand our situation. No one can truly uh, fathom our predicaments. Then, dear congregation, do we begin to see the blessing from this command to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs from God's own word? Not only is it an indication of us being filled with the Spirit, this is one of the ordained means by the Spirit to encourage to strengthen the fellowship of God's people. Not only do the Psalms remind us of God, 
the Psalms, blessed by the Holy Spirit, powerfully minister to the emotional lives of God's people. And there are six things that we can see here about God's own songbook in the fellowship of God's people. Six things. For one thing, the Psalms strike the right balance between divine revelation and human emotion. Friends, as we know, in a lot of uninspired human material, they can be a lopsided focus. Some could be focusing so much on human feelings without a proper theology. Some don't even mention God at all. On the other hand, there could be some that are full of doctrinal truths, but at the same time, not addressing the emotions of the believer. However, with God's own songbook, there is always the perfect balance because God himself is the author. As someone puts it, God is declared and described, but always to stir up our hearts and interact with him through his self-revelation. How important it is for our own Christian growth, especially in times of trials and difficulties. You know, in those times, we can have our view skewed to have a balanced view on things. Then do we see the blessing of God's own songbook? The second thing we see is that the Psalms contain the full range of human emotions. The Psalms contain the full range of human emotions. As we know, we are emotional beings. We were created by God, not as robots, but with emotions. We have varying degrees of emotions. We can have grief and joy. We can have doubt and trust. We can have loneliness and companionship. We can have despair and hope. We can have fear and courage. And we can have complaint. But also, we can have thanksgiving. The list can go on and on. And certainly, the God who created us knows that better than we know about ourselves. And we can see that, yes, in the book of Psalms. This is why the reformer John Calvin said, the Psalms are an anatomy of all parts of the soul. He says, there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented in the mirror. Or rather, the Holy Spirit has here drawn to life all the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, perplexities, in short, all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men are wont to be agitated. Isn't it true, dear believers? The more we are acquainted with the book of Psalms, the more we see all the emotions being covered. There is literally a psalm that can speak to our soul of all different emotions. And the third thing we can see is that the psalms give us the Christian realism, the Christian realism. As we know, Perhaps for many of us only to know it too well. The life of the Christian is not a bed of roses. It is never a pleasant stroll in the garden. The life of a child of God in this sin-corrupted world is not victory upon victory. There are many intense battles. And there are so many times we may feel that we are simply going through the folly of the shadow of death. Maybe we experience the folly experience more than the experience on the mountaintop. 
And we see that in the Psalms. They, these Psalms give us a realistic picture and portrait of the Christian life. And the fourth thing we see is that the Psalms give us a warrant to express our sorrows. It gives us a warrant to express our sorrows. Have we ever thought about this? In the Christian life, we go through those seasons of doubts. We can go through those seasons of feeling downcast, feeling depressed. And there are seasons in our Christian life that we can become so very jealous and envious. And we may find it so difficult to know any uninspired human material to describe our spiritual journey. But that is not so with the book of Psalms. We can sing from Psalm 102 to describe our sorrow. We are warranted to sing from Psalm 73 like the psalmist Asaph to express our envy and jealousy. And we are given Psalm 43 to describe the experience of feeling spiritually downcast. These are songs given by God for you and for me. And what a great relief it is to our souls. Not only does God understand, but he gives us the warrant in his own word for us to express, yes, even our sorrows. What do we see? It's not, it's far beyond, oh, well, great. God has included that in his songbook. No, we ought to see more than that. We ought to see how tender is the Lord, how great, how kind is his mercy to his flock, to his people. And the fifth thing we can see is that the Psalms, blessed by God, can transform our emotions. They can transform our emotions. Yes, not only is God in his wisdom and goodness, giving us the warrant to express our emotions. He's also pleased to use his own word, especially the songbook of his, to transform our emotions. And what a blessing it is. Not only is the Lord understanding, not only is he sympathetic to our trials and our difficulties, but he's also so very pleased to direct our emotions, to lift us up, to bring us from discouragement to encouragement in him, to rescue us from fear to hope, to bring us from sorrow to joy in him. And the sixth thing we see is that the Psalms call us to be sympathetic to other believers. They call us to be sympathetic to other believers. Yes, God in his word, even though, uh, uh, even through his own songbook, God is using this to make us to be aware of the well-being of other believers. As we were reminded this morning, the Lord Jesus didn't save us to be islands but to be in this unity, to be in the family of God. And what, what do we do for other family members, dear people of God? We are to care for one another, not only physically, emotionally, but also spiritually. And what a wonderful blessing it is that we have the book of Psalms given to us. Yes, we may not fully understand the struggles and the sorrows or even the joy and delight of the other believer. Not only does the book of Psalms help us to understand more of our fellow believers, but it also shows that God himself is the one who fully understands us and our brethren in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so, my dear brothers and sisters, do we truly speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs from God's own songbook? Do these six reasons encourage you to study more of the psalms, to be familiar with them, so much, so familiar that we can speak to one another, to encourage one another, to build one another up in the most holy faith. I know it is easier said than done. Maybe we can begin with, perhaps, to, to start to begin with, with a, one psalm to study in depth each week, just one psalm, and to memorize it in our personal devotion to sing it in family worship. And boys and girls, may I encourage you also to know more about God's own songbook than the catchy songs in this world. But dear congregation, are we a people seeking to be familiar more and more with God's own songbook? to the point that we are endeavoring to honor the Lord, to speak to one another, even in our own congregation. These precious songs of Zion, I firmly believe that it would greatly transform our fellowship as it is part of what it means to be spirit-filled believers. And secondly, we are to consider the singing in worship, the singing Yes, not only are we commanded in the Word of God to speak to one another, there is another command to sing. And notice this command to sing. Once again, this singing is continuous. But it is not to sing to one another, but singing to the Lord. Not just once or twice, as I've mentioned, constantly regularly. In other words, not only do we have the speaking with our fellow believers, that horizontal relationship, but the singing here speaks of the most important relationship, that vertical relationship with the Lord. <coughs> yes, I know it, we are in a day and age, <coughs> especially with a modern uh, battle of Worship wars with loud music, singing, congregational singing, and even singing in general is greatly downplayed. Even some may not see the importance of singing at all. However, that is not how God sees, for it is commanded by God himself. Notice it is... It is not only a command to sing in the public worship of God, but this command has also implications in our worship in the home and family worship. And dear congregation, this ought not to be seen as a chore, but it ought to be seen and regarded as a liberating delight and privilege. Just think with me for a moment of the believers at that time in Ephesus, especially those before they came to know the love of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, before they came to know the salvation in him. What were they doing? They would, some of them would be living in drunkenness in their sin, uh, when they were in their sinful past. And they would fully know that in their sinful past, they would have known and sung so many drunkard songs, only to realize that they did all that to their own shame and disgrace. Think of the passers-by. Just like in our days, I mean, Australia is known for excessive drinking culture. When we hear drunkards singing, Many of us want to stay away. In that light, we see what a blessing, what a great privilege. There is this command given by God to sing, to sing from God's own word back to God, 
to praise Him, to rejoice in Him. And this is what the book of Psalms ultimately is about. Not man, not man's emotions, but God. It speaks of God's sovereignty over creation, over uh, God's sovereignty over providence as a king. But also, it's, they all speak of God's sovereignty over redemption as the one who is worthy of our praises and worship. Friends, what better words can we use to sing to the Lord than his very own words? No one knows better about God than God himself. But there is more. Why does God command us to sing his own word back to him in worship? Because he wants us to know clearly. He wants us to know more about the eternal word, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who declared to his people in the upper room after his resurrection. Remember, children, in Luke's gospel, chapter 24, verse 24, the second half, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Do we see the connection here? The connection between the Holy Spirit's work and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's work is not to bring attention to himself, but to bring, to draw us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why he gives us his own divine inspired songbook so that we may behold the glory and the majesty of the Lord Jesus. Dear congregation, I cannot emphasize more. We are not singing the Psalms as Jews. We are singing the Psalms, God's own songbook, as Christians. In other words, we are to sing Psalms as Christ being the center and the worship of God. And there are five quick things that we can see about this wonderful blessing, Christ in the Psalms, in God's own songbook. We are to behold, firstly, the sinless Christ, the sinless Christ. He is the one who is the perfect, upright man of Psalm number one. And he is the one who can undergo the scrutiny of God, even of God, in Psalm 139, search me, O Lord, and know my thoughts, try my thoughts, and still being declared without sin and perfectly holy. He is secondly, the obedient Christ, the obedient Christ, the one who has come, as we sang from Psalm 40, to do the will of God, not as a begrudging slave, but a willing servant, the servant of the Lord. And he is the one who has the word of God hidden in his heart. In Psalm 119, the one who loves the law of God wholeheartedly. He is thirdly the worshipping Christ, the worshipping Christ, the one who truly worships the Lord. The one who truly loves the Lord, as Psalm 116, verse 1, I love the Lord. He can do that perfectly. He is the one whose worship is totally acceptable before God. Fourthly, he is the judging Christ, the judging Christ. He is the one who will bring forth the righteous judgment of God upon the ungodly. On the last day, he is the sovereign king in Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. The one who shall come to right all wrongs. And all those who do not truly pay him homage in true obedience shall perish. Fifthly, in the Psalms we find the sin-bearing Christ. The sin-bearing Christ. He is the one who is promised 
in Psalm 22, in Psalm 69, the one who is not only holy and perfect, but for the sake of his sinful people, he would be sin for his people. He would take upon himself the punishment that his people deserve to stand in their place. As the just for the unjust, the holy for the profane, the righteous for the unrighteous. Friends, do you see why God has in his wisdom and sovereignty given us this songbook of his to sing in his divine worship? He wants us to know this Christ. He wants us to know his only begotten Son. Because without him, there can be no true worship of God. Without the Lord Jesus, without his sin bearing, without his shed blood, our worship would be rejected by God, no matter how many psalms we know, no, mat no matter how many psalms we can sing off the top of our heads. Why? Because God wants us to know not only the words of the Psalms, but the very one the Psalms are pointing us to, the Lord Jesus Christ. Without him, despite our understanding of purity of worship, it would be unacceptable before God. Friends, the question is far beyond whether or not we know the Psalms. But this, have you come to know, have you come to trust the Lord and King of the Psalms or the Lord and King of all the scriptures, the Lord Jesus Christ, in repentance and faith? Because if we do not know, if we don't know personally, if we don't know savingly, this sinless, obedient, worshipping, sin-bearing Christ we shall find him on the last day, the judging Christ, because of our sins. Yes, even the psalms that we sing will testify against us on that last day. But thanks be to God, that day has not yet come. For God is still so pleased to draw sinners to his Son, even through his own word this afternoon. How shall we not flee to this Christ and to lay hold of him? Why? So that we may know what it means to live and walk as children of light. And to know what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And to truly be speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So, dear believers, do we take heed of this command and exhortation? Is that our desire to deepen our understanding and to deepen our love for God's own songbook? Because ultimately, these are love songs about our Savior and Redeemer. And does our identity, is that identity reflected? that identity of being God's people? Does it show forth in how we make use of God's own songbook in private and in public? Do we speak to one another in these love songs, building one another up in the fellowship of God's people? And do we as a people fervently, enthusiastically, and obediently sing back to God these precious songs in his worship out of love and gratitude for the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God our Heavenly Father. May this songbook, the songs from this songbook of God be our own songs to the praise of Christ. Amen. And let us conclude our worship by singing from Psalm number 2, Psalm number 2.
Psalm number 2, and we shall sing to God's praise and glory from verses 6 to 12. Verses 6 to 12. And here, we, in this psalm, we are reminded of the heathen, the, un, the ungodly rulers, the rulers of this world. They are uh, plotting against God and His Christ, His Messiah. But God is not in panic mode. He is not pacing back and forth in worry and anxiety. No, he remains sovereign. And in verse 6, we are given this divine declaration of his own anointed king by his own appointment, his only begotten son. Yet notwithstanding, I have him to be my king appointed and over Zion, my holy hill, I have him king anointed. And uh, yes, we see uh, that even first aid, as of me and for heritage, the heathen now make thine, and for possession I do thee will give earth's utmost line. Yes, and he would come not only to reign in power, but to reign in grace, to draw uh, sinners from all uh, nations to come and to bow before him, to be that heritage of grace. And, uh, and even that warning to the kings, the rulers of this world, in verse 10, Now therefore, kings, be wise, be taught, ye judges of the earth. Serve God in fear, and see that ye join trembling with your mirth. Kiss ye the Son, lest in his ire ye perish from the way. If once his wrath begin to burn, bless all that on him stay. Yes, there's a warning, and this call to lay hold of him, to bow before him, to love him. And there's that blessedness. Eh? blessing on those who find refuge, who take refuge in him, the sovereign Lord and Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us sing to God's praise, verses 6 to 12 of Psalm number 2. Let's stand.
So now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord and King, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.